Hi, everyone. I'm Ivan Buki, and welcome back to Wall Street Silver. Our guest today is the one and only commodities investing guru and the founder of Rule Investment Media. Rick, it's always great to see you. Pleasure to be back. Thank you for having me. Hey, so Rick, uh, it's all over the news is um, JP Morgan's. Uh, uh, there's this criminal trial going on for a bunch of their guys who refused to cop a plea. And, um, you know, this one guy's testifying. This is the latest news that's on Zero Hedge right now is uh, one of the guys who did plea for a, a lesser sentence is saying this was like an open strategy. It wasn't just a couple of rogue traders. This is something these guys were trained on by their bosses. Um, you know, what's, what's your thinking here? You know, Jim, you and I have had this discussion uh, on your show for at least two years. Uh, short term, because manipula- we've only been on for a year and a half. So not okay, a year and a half. Then. <laughs> <laughs> short term manipulation of markets is a function of trading desks. All markets, I think, in the very near term are manipulated. LIBOR has been proven to be manipulated. Markets as large as the U.S. Treasury market and the euro market have been manipulated. Uh, the technique that, which is described, spoofing, uh, is uh, a technique that is as old as published trading. Uh, I remember early in my career in the Vancouver Stock Exchange, it was very common for people to put very large bids slightly below market uh, with a reputable brokerage house uh, and then affect their selling in small pieces through lesser known brokerage houses, a different form of spoofing. Um, What I would really love to see come out in the JP Morgan trial is not so much the near-term manipulation uh, of the spot market or the near futures market, but rather uh, a discussion of the probability that uh, JP Morgan and or others might have used the spot market, the overnight market, the cash market to manipulate the long futures market. Mm -hmm. The circumstance where it is very common for the daily market, the, the, pardon me, the futures market in silver to trade on a daily basis, a hundred times the silver available for good delivery around those contracts uh, and the extraordinary amount of uh, nominal or or notional uh, value in the futures market means that a well-organized syndicate could structure shorts six months, 12 months, 24 months in advance in the futures market, highly leveraged contracts, of course, making the margin payments, and then borrow physical silver, which they sold in the overnight market during periods of time when there was very little liquidity in that market. The idea being in the very near term to drive the price of silver down extravagantly and take advantage of how that would impact the futures markets. Let's say as an example that somebody managed to be short a billion or a billion and a half dollars on margin Mm -hmm. in the out months. And then someone borrowed $50 million worth of silver to dump on the overnight market. Somebody might lose $45 million on the current trade and they might make $100 million (laughs) on the long trade, uh, which is a lot of fun. And I suspect, given the way I've looked at precious metals markets for 30 years, given the fact that these very large trades occur during periods of time when there's no liquidity in the market, that that's precisely what what happens. Why would somebody who was trying to maximize their return on a silver position or a gold position sell a large position during a period of time in the market when it was certain that you couldn't get a good fill? Uh, there mm-hmm. has to be some ulterior motive uh, other than epic stupidity. And I, I, I don't think that's the reason. I, I don't think, as many of the uh, conspiratorialists were, will say, that this suggests that J.P. Morgan or anybody else uh, was engaged in some long, decades-long conspiracy to unlawfully depress the price of silver. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember myself in the 1970s when... I think it was fairly common for trading desks to manipulate the price of silver higher, uh, which is to say you take advantage of market conditions and you take advantage of illiquidity and you take advantage of investor stupidity in the way that's the easiest. 
uh, and so far in this cycle, the down uh, has been the easiest. There will come a time, I suspect, when you will see silver markets manipulated in the near term in the other direction. Mm -hmm. Dad, I'm looking forward to that. Looking forward to that. <laughs> um, so, you know, the other thing going on in the world right now is we have these massive negative real rates, which uh, should be really, pop, really great for gold and silver price, gold prices in particular. And, you know, the, the one example is the European Central Bank just raised interest rates by 50 basis points, half a percent, all the way up from negative to 0% now to fight inflation, which I find mind boggling. They have what, eight, 9% inflation in the Eurozone. They've raised rates to 0%. Crazy. <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds preposterous <laughs> to say it that way, but that's what's going on. Um, so negative rates, I mean, this is negative real rates, right? And so, you know, are you shocked that gold and silver still are not responding to this, mar to this environment? A little shocked, but I have to say, I, again, was around for the decade of the 70s. Uh, and beginning in 1968, it was very obvious, uh, even to uh, a then, what, 17-year-old, that uh, inflation was on the horizon. Uh, and because uh, investors and savers and speculators had lived through 20 fairly benign years prior to 1968, the market didn't notice inflation really till 1972, the politicians till mm. 1974. Uh, fast forward, uh, we've lived now through 40 benign years from 1982 to present. Uh, for most people, inflation is becoming a concern, but it isn't affecting their lifestyle, at least most people who have enough money to invest and speculate. When someone goes to the pump and they're paying five dollars a gallon or something like that it's an inconvenience in two or three years when the purchasing power of their wages and their savings isn't enough for them to buy a new car right uh, in other words when it goes from an annoyance to a lifestyle concern uh, then i think you'll see some action and that's true too with the way people invest people have lived through 40 benign years uh, they have come to believe that the Fed has their, ba the ba their back, that the big thinkers of the world, be they Biden, be they Trump, uh, be they Merkel, uh, are going to kiss everything uh, and make it better. Uh, I suspect those people are going to be disappointed in time. It's interesting that the popular media culture talked about the unexpectedly large increase in Eurozone interest rates and didn't point out, as you did, <laughs> that they just got up to zero. Uh, in other words, the direction merited news, but the quantum did not. It's yeah. really useful for your listeners to cut through the chatter and remember the famous Jim Grant quote about long dated government securities in this pricing environment. He calls them return free risk. If you think about the credit quality of the countries that are involved in issuing this debt and understand that you as the taxpayer are their collateral, uh, if you look at debt to GDP or debt to obligation or debt serviceability, and you look at credit quality that's that, that compromised, and then you look at the fact that your real economic return on the obligation is in the United States minus 5.5% compounded, or in Europe, minus 8% compounded. This is a government guaranteed loss. This is actually the first time in my lifetime that I can remember government keeping a promise that I am certain that they will deliver on. They absolutely positively guarantee me as an American that if I, if I buy a, a US 10 year treasury, that I will lose 5.5% of my purchasing power annually for 10 years. I believe them. <laughs> I, I, I'm always, I'm flabbergasted that people are willing to pay, buy treasuries right now at 3%, you know, in, in, whether it's six months treasuries, two year, five, you know, five, 10, all the way out to 10 th or 30 years, they're all around 3% right now, a very flat yield curve. Who's investing in this crap right now? Well, in the two-year, I am. Uh, uh -huh. Investing is the wrong phrase. I'm storing cash. Uh -huh. 
Uh -huh. uh, I have a choice between going to a commercial bank deposit at 60 basis points uh, or a highly liquid uh, two-year treasury uh, at, at 230, 240 basis points. The answer to that is obvious. I don't consider that to be an investment. Uh, you and I have talked about the fact before that I'm maintaining an awful lot of liquidity in my you're, right, the, you're writing checks right now, I heard. You're looking for good yeah. deals with lots of warrants, right? <laughs> I, I'm, I, let me rephrase that. I'm out there trying to write checks. <laughs> we're, we're coming into the period now where the junior mining companies are returning my phone calls. Uh, for three years, they considered me to be an inefficient source of capital. Mm -hmm. They preferred to get funded by dumb money. Uh, it seems that the dumb money has gone largely to money heaven. Uh, and now they have to return to a few of us, the old timers who are real money. <laughs> but you, but you, you look for, a, you drive a harder bargain when, uh, before you write a check is the problem. That's why they weren't as eager to come to you and before. You know, I have this disgusting habit uh, of trying to understand something about the value uh, of my speculations, mm -hmm. not the direction of illusory quotes. And I also have a belief that if I get a restricted security, one that I can't sell, and if my money is going to be catalytic to the company's growth, that I should be rewarded for that uh, with a warrant. Uh, in rational markets, uh, rational managers agree with me, but we haven't been in a rational market for quite some time. Gotcha. So, so what are some of the specific names? Like um, uh, you, we've talked in the past, you mentioned Silvercrest was a company you really like. What's your thoughts on that one? Yeah, Silvercrest, in the context of a private placement, uh, they have moved from cash consumer to cash generator fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. So the idea that they would do an attractively priced private placement or deign to give me a warrant, the probability of that is nil. Uh, what I like about Silvercrest is precisely the fact that they have advanced the company so well in the last 12 months, going from bankable feasibility study to construction to effective completion. Uh, they aren't at economic completion yet, but they are uh, pouring silver. The project was mostly on time, certainly on budget. While they were involved in the project, they continued to enjoy exploration success, which raises the net present value of the deposit and the price of the equities down. <laughs> yeah, the price is really cheap. A lot of these stocks are cheap. Doesn't get better than this for me. Uh, there was a point in time with regards to Silvercrest when I loved the deposit. I loved the management team. I loved everything they were doing, but I couldn't afford it the price to value seemed ahead of itself to me. Uh, the price of the stock has been absolutely clobbered while the company has added value. So my estimation of the net present value of the company is substantially higher than it was 12 to 14 months ago. Mm -hmm. and the stock price has been cut in half. Yeah. Uh, from my point of view, that's a gift from God. Um, and I, by the way, I'm not using this as a recommendation for people. Yeah. Uh, while Silvercrest, while Silvercrest is certainly suitable for me, it may not be suitable for everybody. Uh, it, it's important to note it in the context of the entire sector. I think Silvercrest is a fine company, but what's important for our discussion now is that the company is, without argument, worth substantially more than it was 12 or 14 months ago. It's been substantially de-risked, and the share price has collapsed. Yeah. Uh, if you have worked hard enough on a stock that you have an opinion as to its value, uh, you should be delighted with share price declines. So, Rick, you know, we, we, we need to talk about the silver price. A lot of people on Reddit and on Twitter are really, you know, despondent about the price falling. Here we are in below $19 per ounce right now. What do you think? Could we go even lower at this point? Uh, yeah, I think two things, Jim. I, I think the people who are despondent need to take their price chart back further. All right, I'll do uh, that. If you look back <laughs> over, you know, if you look back over, say, five years, uh, you have reason to be much less despondent. Uh, people have expectations of change that don't take time and time value of money uh, into account. But could the price of silver go lower? Absolutely. Uh, remember, that more importantly than gold, uh, silver, while it's a monetary metal, is also an industrial material. And to the extent that the world slips into a synchronized global recession, which is sort of what the copper price is telling us, uh, silver could go lower. The truth is that silver has a whole bunch of industrial applications, which will eventually take the price, in my opinion, much, much higher. 
But as an example, if a global recession reduced the demand for water treatment, where silver is an important germicide, or more importantly, solar panels, where silver is the reflectant, it makes perfect sense to me that if we had lower demand for fabricated applications for silver, we could have a lower silver price. It isn't merely uh, a monetary metal. It's at once a monetary uh, and an industrial metal. Mm -hmm. I think that combination ultimately will take the silver price much, much higher, but it could easily go lower first. Yeah, and, and, and you know, let's ask, let's, let's look at the gold chart. It hasn't fallen quite as much, um, although the way I'm displaying it there, it, gold seems to have held up a little bit better at this point. It's still in the 1700s, which is extremely profitable for a lot of the gold mining companies. Um, what are your thoughts on gold right now? Well, it makes perfect sense to me that gold wouldn't have fallen uh, as much. There is uh, incipient fear in the market. Mm -hmm. And when I look back over the almost 50 years that I've been in the market, the primary motivation for the gold buyer in the initial part of the market move, at least, is fear. The silver buyer is different. The silver buyer is a speculator. He, the primary motivation is greed. <laughs> and people like myself, as an example, <laughs> buy reasonable amounts of gold out of fear and hope the price doesn't go up too much. <laughs> it's an <laughs> odd thing. But the, the set of circumstances that would cause the gold price to go higher uh, would be problematic for other parts of my life. And my life is pretty good. Uh, I recognize myself that traditionally in the second half of precious metals bull markets, uh, when there has been a malaise, and we've obviously had a, a long and steep malaise, uh, and momentum is reestablished in precious metals markets, in my experience, the second half of precious metals bull markets uh, become led by silver. Gold establishes the momentum uh, and then silver rises further and faster. And I don't know why that is necessarily, perhaps it's because of the lower unit price of silver and the fact that poor people around the world can participate in the market in silver in a way they couldn't uh, participate with gold. I don't know. I don't know why it's true. I just know that it's true. Uh, and my suspicion will be when this bull market re returns, and I believe with every fiber <laughs> of my being, that a precious metals market will return as long as we have negative real interest rates, uh, that silver will eventually, pardon the pun, uh, outshine gold. When that will occur, I have no idea. Yeah, um, a, lot, a lot of people are, are, are speculating, and I don't know, you're a speculator, so speculate with us. Um, people are waiting for the Fed to sort of pause at this point on increasing the rates. Like there's this been this dichotomy of the Fed's been aggressively raising rates, but Europe wasn't, and a lot of other central banks were not yet. It seems like that's changed where a lot of other central banks are now. Canada just raised 100 basis points. Yep. Um, the, the European Central Bank just raised 50 basis points, a host of other ones. It seems like everyone except Japan um, is raising interest rates now. Um, and then our own central bank might pause in the near future, if you know we're about to enter a recession, if the, if our GDP number uh, stays negative, um, our unemployment numbers are ticking up in the United States, is that like a signal that the Fed might have to pause soon, or do you think the Fed just goes full Paul Volcker and just keeps raising rates? Screw the economy, uh, we're we're raising rates, right? What do you think is likely to happen? Speculate. Somewhere in the middle, uh, full Paul Broker, full Paul Volcker, no. Uh, we don't have the political backing to take the bitter pill that we need to take mm -hmm. anymore. I believe that there is room in the economy uh, to raise rates. I believe that there is enough confidence that rates could go higher. And I believe that the Fed would like to raise rates, if only so that they have the ammo, <laughs> the ability to lower them, uh, to deal with a circumstance. But mm -hmm. let's take raising rates to its... Uh, economic logical conclusion. If you look back over the 49 years that I've been in capital markets, for most of that time, the US 10-year treasury has had a nominal real yield above the CPI stated rate of inflation. Yeah. If the CPI stated rate of inflation is nine, that would suggest that the US 10-year treasury, uh, rather than having a three, five or three, six handle, 
would have to have a 9.5 or a 10 handle. It's been true too over 49 years that the US 30 year mortgage rate, fixed mortgage rate, traded at least 100 basis points in front of the US 10 year treasury. If that were true, then the 30 year fixed mortgage rate would go from five and change to 10 and change. Can you imagine what that would do to real estate prices? Yeah. Uh, everybody yeah. wants somebody else's house to be affordable, not their house. Yeah. Uh, and other forms of debt like consumer debt uh, trade based on the US 10 year treasury. Can you imagine if credit card rates were at 22 or 23 or 24%? If we reverted to mean in terms of real yield, uh, I'm sure, absolutely sure that the economic impact of that would be very similar to the economic impact of the Volcker rises. And the Volcker rate rises for anybody who lived through them was very, very painful. Uh, you know, collapsing equity prices, uh, skyrocketing unemployment, lots of foreclosures, lots of bankruptcy. Uh, as the hippies would say, reality sucks. Uh, so if you think about taking the Fed's actions to their logical conclusion, I don't think that happens. Uh, if the economy begins to falter measurably, uh, if consumer durable sales, which are bought on credit, uh, begin to dry up, if housing starts begin to dry up, uh, particularly if the interest rates paid by federal, state, and local governments uh, eat up substantially larger portions of the current account, that is to say, of the budget, I think the Fed uh, will lose their nerve. I think the politicians will lose their nerve. I think investors will lose their nerve. I think the politicians will lose their nerve. And if that happens, and you see the back, the Fed back off meaningfully on interest rates, uh, then I think the game is really truly on for precious metals. So Rick, uh, you know, I'm going to see you next week in Boca Raton, Florida. You've got your, your resource investment symposium coming up. So tell us about it. I'm going to be there and I'm looking forward to it. Well, first, I look forward to uh, seeing uh, all of my friends uh, face to face. It's been a long time since we were able to do that. Uh, many of your listeners will know that this will be our 30th Natural Resource Investment Symposium. For 27 years, they were live in Vancouver. For the last two years, they had to be virtual because of public health. <laughs> we didn't have the courage to take Americans across the border into Canada with the Arrive Can app and all of the COVID things, but we're going to do a great job uh, in Boca Raton. Let me talk about the conference for, uh, for a few minutes. In the first instance, uh, it stood the test of time. This is the 30th year we've delivered this, which tells you that we've met the market for a very long period of time. Have we done it? The best big picture thinkers that we could get, not the ones you see on CNBC. <laughs> you know, the Daniela DiMartino Booths, the Nomi Prinzes, the Grant Williams, the Doug Casey's, the Jim Rickards, the David Stockman's. People who give you a, a sort of a big picture, macro picture, which you don't see in mainstream popular media. But in addition to that, great gurus, great analysts, great people who devise tactics for you after the big picture thinkers have given you strategy. More importantly than that, and in fact unique, uh, for 30 years, we have featured uh, individuals who have built multi-billion dollar natural resource businesses from scratch. What's important here is that you learn how they built them and you learn how the lessons that they learned made them better investors and can make you a better investor. You learn about tenacity, you learn about persistence, you learn about patience, you learn about the fact that some people simply outperform other people. Some years ago, an attendee told me that watching Robert Friedland and Ross Beattie walk through the exhibit hall talking to exhibitors and note who they stopped in front of, who they smiled about, and who they frowned about was worth the price of admission all by itself. And I concur. And that brings me, of course, to the exhibitors. At most investment conferences, the qualification to be an exhibitor is a check that cashes. Uh, at our conference, you have to be owned in an account that I manage or, or that my former employer Sprott manages. That doesn't guarantee, sadly, Jim, that every stock that I buy goes up. But what it does guarantee is that every exhibitor there has been vetted, mm -hmm. that we know them and understand them well enough that we have put our money in them. The consequence of those four factors is that for 30 years, every educational product that I've offered comes with a full money back guarantee. Any of your listeners 
who come down to uh, Boca Raton, come to the conference and don't feel like they got their money's worth out of the admission can email me, no questions asked, and I'll give them a full 100% refund. Sounds good. Um, is there a virtual option for people who can't make it to Boca or is this uh, yes, live we, only? No, we opened up the door to the virtual option yesterday uh, mm -hmm. for those people who can't go to Boca. By the way, there's a lot of communication that's nonverbal. So if it's possible for you to attend physically, absolutely positively do it. Mm -hmm. The lovely thing about the virtual conferences that we've done for the last two years, that we've been able to host investors from over 30 countries who wouldn't otherwise have been, been able to attend physically. So yes, there's a physical option, the preferred option, and there's a virtual option for those who are unable to avail themselves uh, of the physical option. Well, we'll definitely leave uh, the link in the description. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be there personally. If anyone wants to come hang out with me and have a drink, I will be there. <laughs> and I believe uh, uh, the Economic Ninja is also going to be there uh, with me. So uh, anyone who wants to hang out, we will be there on site uh, at, at Rick's conference. Well, Jim, I want to hang out. So I look forward <laughs> to having you down there. We'll have a good time. We definitely will. And I'll see you there uh, next week.